Uh, let's take a minute and just pray for the word. Father in heaven, we come right now and Lord, we just ask that, uh, that your heart, that your vision for the church, for your calling of the church, that we will be able to have this conversation. And, and Lord, may we become the bride of Christ, the hands and feet of God, to do the work of the ministry so that your name may be glorified in all that we do. Amen. Well, I get to do five-fold ministry. The question is, how does five-fold ministry relate to elder rule? Elder leadership models community. To be able to demonstrate through the plurality of voices, to hear each other, to hear the fullness of God's will. Did you, did you catch that? That's, that's big. The plurality of voices among the leadership to then hear the fullness. Can one individual bring the fullness of what God wants to do? Well, we have some examples in the Old Testament, but, well, Moses, Miriam, his brother, Ruth had the father. I mean... Every time I look at Scripture, very rarely is someone solely bringing a single voice to the issues and problems. Even Jesus, he turned around and he sent the 12. He sent them by what? Twos. I'm going to go back to it's good for man to be alone. You know, Somehow when God designed us, he designed us to interact with each other. The problem with this is, Richard, I don't always like the way you do it. And you don't always like the way I do it. And then we get paired up. And we have to figure out how to do it. But it starts with listening to each other and respecting. The, and I'm, I'm using the word voice here for a reason. The voice, the voice is the calling that the Lord has for you to walk where you belong Functioning in spiritual gifts, functioning in talents in the world that you live in. But you can't do it by yourself. So here it is. Elder rule. We have, we believe that elder rule is the model that the Lord has for us. And the primary, one of the primary reasons, two reasons, is to demonstrate the plurality of voices and equip the body to do the work of the church. Kind of sits at those two. Scott, what do you think? At work? Mike? Nate? You know, we've had some conversations, you know, to get up here and talk about what the elders are doing and not being an elder. I'm going, okay, <laughs> if I'm going to say it, you're going to have to be accountable to it. So is it okay to say this? And they went, Yes. Um, so know that we have talked a lot. We have struggled through some of this. And, and I'm, and I'm going to try to talk about it in ways that, how it applies to us. Um, I want to give a little history. I have been involved in elder leadership numerous times without senior pastors. Can I just tell you? They all failed miserably. <laughs> I remember coming to this church and talking about this, and I looked at them and said, good luck. It's going to fail. Now, I'm not a fan of senior you know, pastor either, because I really, at the core of who I believe, I believe fivefold ministry is the heart of leadership, the plurality of voices. The problem is it just takes a lot of work, a lot of patience, and a lot of love, and the willingness to say, I don't have to have it my way. And when you put a bunch of human beings in the same room, our battle is not against what? Flesh and blood, but against powers and principles. And that battle becomes real. You know, Nate, who I believe, and he does, has a shepherd's voice. 
And he spoke the other day, two weeks ago. And he, he, was, he was at the heart of his voice speaking this message. And I'm sitting there going, I wouldn't say it that way. I wouldn't say it that way. I wouldn't say it that way. And I wouldn't say it that way. I don't have a shepherd's voice. Of course I wouldn't say it. But you know what I said? Oh, but did he say it? Good. And it was good. And I learned something. The other day, Nate and I were talking about something. And talking about encouraging somebody in, in a form, in ministry. And he did it again to me, you know. He just spoke from his voice. And I went, God. I just sat there and said, okay, you win. I don't want to talk anymore. I get it. But, but the heart of his voice came out in, in such a tender and safe and real. I realized, yeah, in this situation, that's the voice I need to listen to. And I need to take that and adapt it and, and not come in with my voice. Because my voice is kind of apostolic and it's prodding and pushing and, and nudging and irritating. I get it. But it's not as bad as the prophetic voice <laughs> that snaps us in the line. <laughs> so I got that going for me. <laughs> so so do, do, do you get the idea of this plurality and leaderships? Well, they've got to operate at the eldership level. First question is, well, well, Mike, do you have all five voices up on the elder board? And the answer is no. So then the next question is, are all five voices required? Yes, but not on the elder board. Should they be looking for those voices? Hmm, where do you think those voices may be? Could they be sitting in the chairs? Could they also, hmm, we have a relationship with an Albuquerque church pastor that has talked with the elders. Is that a voice that comes in and speaks? Randy Hill has spoke. There's other ones. So, so it's not like, okay, let's put all the little, okay, well, we really didn't have this piece, so we need to fit this puzzle. No, here's the thing. We're the puzzle pieces. And God knows the puzzle and the picture. And you know what thing about it is, I was doing a puzzle the other day. And first time in my life, when you do a puzzle, what do you start with? The edge pieces. Uh-uh. All the edge pages were exactly the same color with a brown line going through it. It was a nightmare. So you know where we started? In the middle. <laughs> and we worked from the inside out. I've never worked a puzzle that way. It, it, it just seemed wrong. <laughs> but you know what? It worked. Because we then got enough pieces that we could bring those other pieces in and make it work. Um, We're so conditioned to our systems, our worldviews. I am going to present an idea that the divine conspiracy, Dallas Willard talks about the divine conspiracy, great book, um, great theologian, that the enemy has conspired to break down the community of Christ, to get us to not work together, not hear each other, and not be. Because when we can come together in unity in Christ, there's nothing stopping of us. If you don't believe me, look at the 12 disciples. 12 men changed the world. We have the same Jesus. But the problem is, you know where you get to the point where you're going to push a button We're so concerned with my calling, my gifting, my ministry, my this, that we forget that he put us with everybody else. And, and I, only, I only can be who I am with all of you. Historically, when you talked about who you were, you never used, no one ever used before the 19th century, 20th century, 20th century, you didn't use the word I. I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. We use the word I all the time. If I would refer to my 
m- you know, my family, I would say I am the son of William Egan. I would always put myself in the context of my community and the greater community. I think we need to go back to that. I think in the church today, we're so busy about me and mine and how I'm going to do it that I forget about you. And I need you so bad to be who I am because I'm only a piece of the pie. And I won't be able to be who I am until the rest of it comes into. So what does that mean? There's three words. I, I'm going to use the word I here, have to take full responsibility, full accountability, and have full authority. And if you take full responsibility, full authority, and full accountability in who you are, and we come together, can you imagine what that looks like? One of our favorite thing is, here I go again. What are the elders going to do? Don't they know they're supposed to tell us what to do? It's no different than the senior pastor. You know what the elders say? No? (laughs) There are some things that they're going to take authority, responsibility, and accountability for. But their primary role is equipping the saints to do the work of the church. So where does it fall back to? Us. So we get into this wonderful little conflict. They're looking at us and we're looking at them. And we become paralyzed as the body of Christ. I say all this to say, I've tried this experiment. (laughs) It hadn't worked. I came here, and we're in this again, and I'm going, thanks, Lord, appreciate that. I thought I was going to retire. And uh, there's some nuances that are different. We'll get into those nuances. That's not going to be this conversation. But those nuances give me great hope that it can work. And I can see it working better than I've ever seen it. And we learn from our failures. Gentlemen, this ain't going to be a failure. So, welcome to my opening. Now we get to the content. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7 and 11 and through 13. My wife is going to read this for me. Do you hear that? He gave. And, and, and by the way, have you noticed I've been using the word voice instead of office or calling? Because in the church today, we've screwed up the words office and calling and anointing, and I have no clue what those words mean anymore. And when you throw those out to people, they go, oh. <laughs> it's simply how God created you as the, the piece of the puzzle. And that's your place. That's your voice. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move away from calling and move away from office and try to demystify, you know, the apostle, the prophet. Just say, Nate comes from a shepherd's voice. Mike comes evangelistic voice. <laughs> he said something the other day. He says, I've been screaming this for years. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they do <laughs> and they're calling they're recruiters they're calling us come on come on let's go see what God is doing come on you could do it they're great voices you know boy do we need them they make us get off the couch 
you know? And then the shepherd voice comes in there and says, Slow down, son. <laughs> We're wearing him out. <laughs> and then they have a conversation. The plurality of voices coming together. So, let's go back and look at Ephesians. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bonds of peace. If this is going to work, we have to work really hard to keep unity and keep peace. Because the number one thing the enemy wants to do is says, hey, you know my friend of offense? Yeah, here, Mike, catch. <laughs> you know, Richard, catch. And, and, and it was interesting. The first year, when I came here two years ago, six weeks, we had... Mike Kleinpeter teaching on what? Offense. Well, I don't know if it was six weeks, but it, it, was, it, was, it, it wasn't a one message. It was a multiple message. And it was like, poof, 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 poof. I went, God, why? That's what I was saying to myself. Why are you pounding us on this? Well, because you know what? If we bring our friend offense to the game, we lose. We lose. So what we have to do, if I want to hear your voice, I'm going to have to work really hard of one, not thinking that I'm better than you and I'm hearing God and you're not. I'm sorry with that one. I don't think we're, none of us are really there. Um, and if we are, we really got to change that. Um, but yeah, protect peace at all cost. It is the unity of the body where we come together so the fullness of Christ may come forth. Yeah. Because what's our reputation? Is the church the reputation of, of a church of peace and unity? I think the enemy has won. But what do we unite on? It says it right here. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one Baptist, one God and Father. Can we come together in that oneness and allow all the other things that divide us not be the central key issue? And if we do that, hmm, I start hearing the voices and the callings and the giftings of others. So, verse 7, to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. So, part of what we need to understand is that Christ is doing something here. He's releasing his grace, and he's apportioning something. What is it that he's apportioning? He says it. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to us to do what? To equip us, his people, for the works of service. Those voices are given in the body of Christ so that we get to do the stuff. Now... If we're sitting there going, well, that's really fine, but Mike's doing the stuff, and Scott's doing the stuff, and Richard's doing the stuff, and Bruno's doing the stuff. Yeah, there's other people doing the stuff. I got my fantasy football league to worry about. I tried to pick something neutral in there, and I figured that was fair. Because <laughs> I didn't want to go like, oh, God, I'm pointing someone out, you know. So that we may become mature, attending to the full measure of the fullness of Christ in our life. Oh God. It only starts when you choose to take full responsibility, full accountability, and full authority in every part of your life. So what does that might look like? You know, that might look like, I don't know, I'm prepared a whole message today. And Richard walks in. That teacher voice walks in and says, you know what, guys? I have to give this message today. And we hear the Spirit of God resonating in that. And all of a sudden, our scheduled agenda gets pushed to the side and that voice comes up and speaks. Because God says, hey, I've given and apportioned this. 
And right now, this voice needs to be heard. And instead of going, well, we can work you in the schedule November 6th, we go, yeah, I hear the resonant of God there. Now, now, now by the way, I could eat something last night and get a little bellyache and think that I heard from God. And, and, and I'm not the sole person that says, I'm supposed to do this today and we're supposed to bump the schedule. He come. He comes in and he talks with the other voices and the other voices come into that unity and we come in together and we say yes and amen. And if that yes and amen is not there, then that's the problem. Hearing God sometimes really, you know, we can hear God pretty well. That timing thing. I need the timing of all the other voices. To hear the other voices so I understand the timing better. Because I kind of get what God is doing. But man... I'm really bad about knowing when to do it. So I really depend. There's people I call up and say, hey, this is what's going on. You think this is a good time to do it? <laughs> Nate goes, no. Okay. <laughs> when would you think it's good? Because I'm not going to hold it for my whole life. <laughs> we'll work towards it. Yeah, that shepherd voice. Or yeah, that's the message we need to hear right now. That's, that system is happening. Believe it or not, it's happening within the elders. It was happening with the previous set of elders. I'm not saying, oh, by the way, this group's getting it. No, they got it. It was demonstrated there, hearing the voices. So, are you willing to take responsibility, authority, and accountability for your gifting and callings to be everything you're supposed to be in the body of Christ? And if you're not, you should have a conversation with Jesus. Not with us. None of us can make you do it. But we get so preoccupied with all the clutter of life, the great deception runs us around the house instead of with violence, the gospel will be proclaimed by violent men and proclaim forward and go out because people have taken that accountability, responsibility and authority and says, I am going. But the moment we start going that way, we are going to bump. And our friend Mr. Offense is going to try to rise. We choose not to let it win. So, first of all, we have to understand, the book of Ephesians was written to an everyday common people, not leaders. If you see leadership in this passage, it is because you are looking through a Western lens of leadership and not through the Ephesians lens of everyday common person who reads it. Remember, it was written to the church. It wasn't written to the leaders of the church. So when Paul is talking, who's he talking to? I'm going to stand over here. Us. (laughs) Not them. Now, it applies to them, but in the context of us. One of the problems with church leadership is we have modeled church leadership based off a corporate model. I don't believe off a biblical model. We'll get into that a little more. So, how do we get here? Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How do we get here? Who's the head of the church? Jesus. And who will build the church? Jesus. And if any of us says, excuse me, Jesus, you need to move over. I'm doing this. Can't do it. First of all, we all recognize that Jesus is... Now, we say that. But then, all of a sudden, God tells me something, and I hear the Lord, and so, okay, I'm going to do it. And I don't care what Jesus or you guys think. Isn't that what we're guilty of? We're guilty of that. He made us to live in community. And that's what we should. Let me say, we should demand to see in our leadership. Community morality voices. And if we don't, we have to say, hmm, 
what happened. So, Jesus builds it. And this, see, this is what's really important. I didn't pick these names. See, one of the things I have a problem with is we try to call something something else when the Bible calls it this. Well, I don't believe in apostles today. I don't care. Jesus used the word. I gave to the church apostles. Okay? There should be what? Oh, well, who do you think to call yourself that you're an apostle? And I've heard that one, you know. Well, I'm sorry, you know. I used to hide from that. I used to go, God, if I say that out loud to people, people will think that I'm arrogant and prideful and I shouldn't say it. And then the Lord just spanked me one day. He says, who are you to call yourself anything different from what I call you? Yeah. Yeah. That one hurt. And then I had to start using it. Oh, God, and that hurt. Because <laughs> when you start using it, people chew on you. <laughs> they really do. So, Jesus' grace for ministry was measured out in five callings the apostolic grace, the prophetic grace, the evangelistic grace, the pastor, shepherd grace, and the teacher grace. By the way, I don't like to use the word pastor. I tend to like to use the word shepherd because in every other place in Scripture, shepherd is used, except here. That's where the word pastor comes in. And so, and, and when, when, when Scripture is talking about David being the good, and Jesus being the good shepherd and all that, the, the shepherd image is such a better image of that voice than, because I don't know what pastor means anymore. He's the guy who runs the building. He's the guy who takes care of the bills. He's the one who preaches on Sunday. That one confuses me. Shepherd. Oh, I have to figure out what that means. So I believe it's a divine installment of what God is doing in the church. For whom the whole body joined, knitted together by what, by what every joint supplies according to the effective work by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edification of itself in love, Ephesians 4.16. You know, one of the things that when you talk about spiritual gifts, by the way, there's a whole conversation on Romans gifts, creation, motivation gifts, spiritual gifts, everybody has them, offices, calling. By the way, we have them. There are books upon books upon books upon books on this topic, and they don't agree. When you start talking about spiritual gifts and callings and you're talking about motivations, it's complex. So one of the things that I want to present is you may have a personal belief on this. And by the way, if it differs from what we're presenting, let's talk. Because we may need to expand. <laughs> you like that? We may need to expand our understanding because your voice was lacking in it. Or we may do to expand your understanding because our voices were lacking in it. I don't know which one. But it's one of those. Um, but if, unless we choose some common conversation and language to talk about this, we'll never be in unity. Because, well, I, you, know, you know, Jack Hayford says this, and, you know, Dennis Soule says this, this, and Stanley said this, and, you know, you know. Okay, I'm going to go on a rabbit trail. One of the problems in the Christian church today, we listen to too many podcasts. We listen to too many teachings, and we listen to them. Because before we process what we heard, we're going to the next one. Let me ask the question. What is unprocessed food? Waste. What do you think unprocessed God information is? If we can't bring it in and apply it, it becomes what? Waste. What do we do with waste? So, I, I encourage you to guard yourself from how much input you have. If you're getting so much input that you're not able to process that input, then guess what? You're probably producing too much waste.
Where was I? The divine design of Christ. So let's talk about these voices. Apostolic voice. Okay. The one who was sent, the apostle, knew Jesus. They don't exist today. That's the, the, that's the message we hear. Well, no. Let, let's, let's demystify this a little bit. The apostle. He's a networker. He sees how people fit in. The puzzle pieces go together. He ensures that faith is transmitted from one context to another context. My friend Jody Campbell has an apostolic voice. Sometimes I think it's a prophetic voice, an apostolic, because it really confuses me. And sometimes you work in two or three sometimes. I, I can't explain that either, but I see it. But her, her apostolic voice, she's always putting things in context for us. Have you noticed that? That's that apostolic voice that's coming out. I've, I pay attention when I hear that voice in her. I also pay attention when she does other things. But, <laughs> but I really pay attention when I go, oh, she's putting something in context for me. I got I to gotta pay attention and apply this. A little bit, here's the problem with the apostolic and the prophetic. They'll run you ragged, and the, and the evangelist. They'll run you ragged. They'll keep you hopping so fast that you can't have time to process. Now you have a bunch of waste because they're just going to Thank God we have the teacher. And thank God we have the shepherd says, whoa, slow down. <laughs> but that's the dangers of the apostolic voice is they're so big and, and they're so large. And so this, we go, ah, I don't want to do that. And that's where those other voices come in. By the way, in our teaching, have you noticed that we have multiple voices coming? How I encourage you is different than how Mike or how, how Nate or how Richard does. And, you, and you see, do you see how those voices are out there? And when you, I keep saying we're having a conversation about elder-led. Because last week you heard the shepherd's voice. Today you're hearing an apostolic voice. These voices are going to be speaking from different sides. You know, there was a reason we had Richard be the moderator for when the elders are up here. He's that teacher voice. And he's going to lead it differently than us. But we believe that's the right voice to lead it. Getting it? Starting to see how it works? Okay, the prophetic voice. I love the prophetic voice. God, do we need a prophetic voice in the church today. More so than ever. But with all the craziness, we want to keep them out in the lobby. Can't. You, gotta have, you, you can't keep them out in the lobby. You can't try to control them. You have to, by the way, prophetic voices... God, do they need that shepherd's voice in their life and that teacher's voice in their life to help that message come in so that it can be transmitted to the body. Because you know those prophetic voices are kind of rough on the outside. And, and so there's some conversations with the other voices so that that message can be clear. But they're the plumb line. We're pff, crooked over here. What are they doing? They're calling us back to that place. We're crooked over here. We're coming back to that place. Their heart is to always keep us in where the center of the Lord is. What a precious gift that is. They're always calling you to integrity and character. <laughs> They're pushing that in character, you know, integrity and character button on you every time they get a chance. They're irritating, aren't they? And they, they at the core, test our, our assumptions. They challenge our assumptions and what we, how we look at life and the Lord and the body. And we need that. And they're uncomfortable. We have the evangelistic voice. You know, imagine the, you know, the, the, you know, the cows and your head, the guy, he's got the whip and he's herding the cows. Come on! Come on! Yeah, that's them. They're snapping that whip. They're recruiters. You know, they call us to action. They call us to personal responsibility in our walk and our ministry in life. And they are saying, come on, let's see what God is doing. 
Just talking about that makes me tired. <laughs> but they're good. Oh, God, do I need them in my life. Then we have the shepherd's voice. My wife, she's got a shepherd voice. You know, the thing about my wife, you sit with my wife for about 30 seconds, you know what you feel? Safe. You just feel safe. That's not because my wife's a safe person. Well, she is because she has this voice, but you get my point. This, her calling and her presence allows you to come in and you're just like, oh, it's okay. It's like Scott Campbell. I mean, he annoys me. Scott Campbell, in, in his voice, he, he, he says these things. Well, that's why you're here. Or, how many times people have experienced this? Something's going on, and he says, it's okay, it's going to work out. And you just know that that's true. Experience that? I know I have. You know? Love those voices. Last is the teacher voice. He brings understanding. She brings understanding. By the way, this is he and she. Um... This is not a gender thing, although only men can do this. <laughs> Women on that side, men on that side. We get to do it, you can't. No! <clears throat> they lay foundations. They train. They equip. Now, we all equip. All these voices equip, but we do it in different ways. But they help build that formation and that layering. So, one way to think about this. If I'm going to build a house... I need the concrete people to come and do the foundation. I need the electrical. I need the HVAC guys to come in and put the air conditioning. I need the plumber. You know, I need the guy who's going to put on the roof. I need the people who's going to do the wall, drywall, and painting. Now, not any one of these crafts or trades can build a house. But together, the house is built. That's what we have to remember. Together, the house is built is built. So, I'm going to really oversimplify this, but let's imagine that the evangelist comes to recruit and says, we need to go out and reach the homeless. Well, traditionally, we go, great idea, you lead it. Can I just tell you something? You don't want the evangelist figure out how to do this. <laughs> because they're going to have us out there five days a week. <laughs> you might say, evangelist, great idea. Hey, we're going to bring this apostolic voice in because they understand how it fits, how everybody fits together in the pieces and how people you can use. Okay? And by the way, when we go out and reach them, what do we want to do with them? Well, we want to disciple them. Ah, oh, so now let's bring the teacher voice. And let's build a team of leaders. Uh, uh, <coughs> anyway, evangelistic voice, apostolic voice, and a teacher voice. And now we have a team of voices working together in their strengths. Now, here's the problem. Who's in charge? First of all, who's the head of the church? Christ. So who's in charge? Christ. Now, this is a Tony Egan opinion on a piece of scripture. It talks about the gift of administration. I personally don't believe the gift of administration is it's the guy who knows how to do the books and open the doors and organizes the church. Why I believe that is because when you read scripture, to be true today, it had to be true then. Then didn't run the church like we run the church today as administrators. So I'm not sure that passage applies to that definition of administrator. As I have looked at this and talked with some other friends and done some study on it, I tend to think that the gift of administration is, remember that team, evangelist, da-da-da? All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's going to go, and give it to the, how to do it, maybe to the evangelist. And now the apostolic... And the teacher picks the lead. But the next time we put them together, it may not be that. It might be the pastor or the teacher who has that. And I think that gift circulates. That's why the plurality of voices, one, we hear the voice and the calling in each other, and then we go, hey, God, who, who gets to drive this party on this specific situation? 
you know, in our eldership, it's really good. Our eldership is over the whole. And this is one of the things that, that allowed me to go, oh, I have a chance and hope. But each one of the elders have specific authorities in certain areas. We all know that Nate is an elder. Now, we're going to go back a couple months when Mike wasn't an elder. Because <laughs> this analogy works better then. And Mike has the authority to run the worship team. And Nate's on the worship team, and he's the elder. So does that mean Nate tells Mike how to do it? Or does M Nate submit himself to the delegated authority that was given to Mike, and they work together? You, you see how that works? You, you can't always put it on a flow chart. <laughs> And the reason you can't put it on a flow chart is because God keeps reapportioning the grace. <laughs> and you got to catch up with him. <laughs> so, not every one of these trades can build a house, but together we build the house. So, I want to talk a little bit about how we got here because understanding the divine conspiracy really helps. So who changed the DNA? Who changed the blueprint? Well, one of my favorite people, John Calvin, 1500s. He wrote a commentary on the epistle of Ephesians. And basically, one of the things he did is he took 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 12. That was the hint. Yeah. Um, love never fails, but where there are where there's prophecy, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be silent. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked as like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Okay, he took this and he brought it over to Ephesians. And what he basically said was, now that we have canonized scripture, we no longer need the apostle, prophet, an evangelist because we have the pastor teacher to interpret the fullness of God. Do, do you see how he got there? I disagree, but he did this in the 1500. And ever since, believe it or not, these people who train pastors have been coming from this philosophy. It's the core of sensationalism, no, dispensationalists. Okay, it's the core. That what they say is, well, now that we have the fullness of God, we don't need... Now, they were, per, they, they were needed back then, and maybe God will appoint someone special if it breaks down. But generally, we don't need it. So, uh, slide 21. Ah, see it? Christ gave to the church shepherds, teachers, prophets, evangelists, pastors. No, we don't need the bottom half of the body. We only need the top half of the body. How well does it walk? But which model have we been living under? Which model have we been trained to operate from? Does that line up with Ephesians? I don't think so. By the way, I didn't do this. Can you go back to slide 12? Yeah, there's a PowerPoint slide 12. Oh, you got it? Oh, there you go. See, fivefold ministry, God's grace, it's like going into a prison and comes out. Pastor, prophet, evangelist. Go to the next slide. See it? In Christ, he was all of these. He operated in all of these. He was perfect in all of these. But then when he apportioned to the body, so for some reason he went, learn how to get along. So, That's how we got here. And it, you know, you've, you've, you've heard it a million times. You know, if you are shooting a rocket to the moon and if you're 
0.001 off your calculations, you'll miss the moon by what? 100,000 miles? Well, in the 1500s, that 0 0.00 lie came into the body of Christ. That said, returned it to a priest function instead of a body function. And we've been operating that way since. It's tough. So, what do you think? Are you ready to stand in your voice, your calling, to be all that God has created you to be? Now, by the way, are we all elders? Nope. The elders' responsibility, county authority, are a little higher than mine. But what I believe is, is that if you want to say, you know, we, we have people who have just gone, oh, wow, I have a voice. I didn't know it. And they're today going to start learning what their voice is. Well, you think we're going to throw that voice into the fire and say, oh, you're an elder. <laughs> Probably not. So we have levels of authority, responsibility, and accountability, and levels of voices. Every voice. But, but what we need to do is put our ears on so even if the brand new person who's just learning their voice says, oh, da-da-da-da, wow, did you hear that? Yeah. We need to respect each of those voices. Now, there may be some lack of maturity in some of those voices because they're learning how to use them. And can we choose not to give offense or take offense because of it? I hope so. Why? For... Let's work really hard for what? Unity and the bonds of peace so that we can give glory to God. So today, you may know your voice, but your voice has been quiet. Do you need to ask God to say, kink it up? Lord, I don't know what my voice is. This is brand new to me. You know? By the way, what are the ways to find out? Go ask. By the way, the elders have talked about, hey, you know, what voices do we see in people? Now, now some of them we don't see because you've been hiding it. you got to come out. By the way, you know the best place to come out? Open your homes to hospitality. Bring people over and see what happens. Yeah. When the, when the body of Christ gets together, these voices start going. If you find yourself in a negative criticizing position... You're probably not using the correct voice. You're using a contaminated voice. We are to build and equip and release and love. Now, I'm in the correction. You know, I've, I've, I've corrected lots of folks. That's a private matter. That's not a body matter. It doesn't get thrown out. Unless, unless the person there brings it to that level. And if I bring it to that level, then... Richard, smack me in the back of the head standing right here. Oh, God, please. Because if I bring that kind of my voice and that control to that level, then I do need to be corrected and corrected publicly if I'm doing it publicly. But most of the time, let's try not to do that. We'll do it when we have to. And by God, let's hear the Holy Spirit when we have to do it. And let's do it protecting the bonds of peace and unity. So, do you know your voice? Do you know your calling? Do you know the portion of grace that's been given to you? Are you taking full responsibility and accountability and walking in it? If not, let's start doing it today.